Let me take you back to a time, a time long ago, right after the Civil War. You know, people were mostly settled in the East and people moved from the Carolinas and from the South and they went North and West. Now this was, this was land that really hadn't been settled, but this is land that people thought, I can farm on this land. I can raise a family on this land. So there was a great expansion of people that, that left country to go make a new start. As times went on, there become a need for people to have more to eat than what they had. There wasn't a lot of stuff like beef running around out there in the Great West that was wild. But after the Civil War, because there was no one that had took care of these cattle for five and six years, there were abundance of longhorns. South Louisiana, all through across Texas, northern Mexico, into New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma. Now there were some folks got together one time south of San Antonio, and they were talking about, you know, let's gather them up because the price of these cattle in South Texas were anywhere from 12 to $14 a head. A man had read an article in the newspaper in Chicago, in New York City, cattle could bring as much as 40 bucks a head. How are we gonna get them up there? You know how many miles it is from San Antonio to New York City to drive, try to drive cattle that far? So we needed somebody to come along all through this time and have us what? A trail, a mapped out place that we knew we could go. It was the Chisholm Trail, named after Jesse Chisholm. He was a man that had been down this trail, a man that knew cattle, a man that knew all about the, the land that they were gonna be in. He knew where you could stock that wagon when you took it down the trail, whether it be at the Fleetwood store or plumbing to Abilene, Kansas. Why Abilene, Kansas, you say? There was a railway that had come in there, a center hub. Now we didn't have to take cattle to New York City or Chicago because you could take them a little over 620 something miles, put them in a set of pens, they sorted them off, loaded them in rail cars, and they went. Now, we talked about the Chisholm Trail, and for years, cattle went up and down it. 2,500 head, and maybe there's two to three bunches a year, you're looking at close to 10,000 head of cattle. This Chisholm Trail, folks, didn't actually wear out, it was grazed out. Later on in the cattle drive area, there was the Great Western Trail. But as that trail even played out a little, the Goodnight Loving Trail. So there was many trails here that took cattle to the north, but they were all for one purpose, to feed the great expansion of people. The railhead changed the cattle business more than anything in the late 1860s, early 1870s. There was record of some herds being over 2,500 head large. Now, with that many cattle and you're taking them up a trail, you're gonna need somebody to gather them all up. They were cowboys. Now cowboys really ranged in age most of the time from I would say 17 to 35 or 40. Sure, there were some old timers there, but them old timers became the cooks. They become the trail boss. And there was usually 12 to 15 that would push these cattle north. And you gotta feed them. And that's when it came about. The chuck wagon. The first Mills on Wheels ever invented. Get you a good old set of mules there and hook them up and you would head out. Now, the cook was gonna stock that wagon before he left, and we're talking about pounds upon pounds of flour, coffee, beans, sugar, hardtack. We might have some dried meat. In typical days, we're gonna be anywhere from 12 to 14 miles. Old cook, he'd pull that team in there, unhook, hobble them up somewhere, pull the wagon sheet off of that wagon, stretch it out there with two poles, stake it down to the ground, give him a little fire pit, put him some hanging iron over the top of it, and he was ready to set up and go to work. And as them cowboys come in, it was more like in shift work because you had to have somebody out there watching that herd. You know, life on the trail was hard. There was trials, tribulations, things happened, people died. We created a podcast that just talks about these things for our Patreon folks. If you're interested, be sure and check it out. But the cowboys knew that when they got into camp, Old Cookie would have something fixed for him. He would. Might not be the greatest meal in the world, but they was gonna eat supper. Then what? He'd be ringing that dinner bell. Early in the morning, four o'clock, he'd be clanging that old triangle. Get out of bed, boys, or I'm gonna throw it out. Here they'd come. Guess what was on the menu? Coffee, beans, and biscuits. 
Now, coffee back then made the same way we make it today, just good old boiled coffee. But I guarantee you it was a whole lot stouter than what we make today. And then them fellers would just go right up, get them a little plate of that, finish, come by, throw it in a wreck pan or what we call the dishwashing pan, mount up, go out there and let's get started. Cookie would have somebody a lot of times help him break down camp, catch the mules, hook up the team, we're headed off. But this time, folks, we're gonna put in a full day of it. We're probably gonna go 14 miles. Ain't no lunch break. We're gonna go all the way, set up camp, and start it over. Now, we know typically there was two meals a day. And folks, there wasn't a lot to them, you know, but there's gonna be some, some days that things are gonna get a little better. Cause when old Cookie stocked that wagon before he left down our south of San Antonio, he got plenty of sugar. And something that old Cookie would always tell you, he would hide that sugar sack because you'd get some of them fellers come by there, wet a finger, get her in there, get them some of that sweetness. And I guarantee you old Cookie would have had him some dried fruit. So on, on occasions, there would be a cobbler. And ooh, would them fellers eat it up late of an evening because they needed something sweet. But a lot of times too, if you ever passed a fruit tree going down the trail, and back then folks, there was a lot more fruit up and down here than what there is now. Oh, Cookie would gather some up because we could have what? Something that was simple and easy as it could be and that'd just be like stewed apples. Dried meat and jerky, sure, it was pretty abundant, but hey, we come up on what? There's a deer up there. Oh, Cookie's a pretty good shot, so let's just go ahead and shoot him. Fresh camp meat. Now he ain't gonna sit there and dress this thing out. We're gonna waste a lot of time. He's gonna quarter that thing up, salt it a little, put it in the wagon, and take it with him. We're gonna eat some cured meat as we go along. Well, you say they had 2,500 head of Big Macs out there. Well, folks, that beef was going to market. It wasn't gonna be to eat. Now, if one fell down dead in the trail, he wasn't gonna waste, they was gonna eat him. But folks, remember, times were hard, times were lean, but old Cookie had a job, Cowboys had a job, and they both did it well. Now, on occasion, I promise you, there was critters that come into camp that ended up in the pot. It'll happen. Now, there was a lot of old folks used to tell me that when they were sitting in them old camps and you'd have something like maybe get really, the cook would get really experimental one day and we were having chili. But you know what that chili meat was made out of? Rattlesnake. Now you kill a big old snake or two or three and you go ahead and just bone him out and ain't a whole lot of meat on a snake. And we're gonna throw some peppers in it. We're gonna throw some beans in it because that's about the only thing we have for meat. Now, prickly pear, hey, there's a lot of them going up and down the trail. In a certain time of year, they'll make a big old berry. Cook that down a little, we got something sweet to go with it. So Cookie's gonna make the most of whatever he had. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised, folks, if a possum or a raccoon come through camp that he didn't make breakfast or supper one. Now, one really iconic dish that you might have heard of, and you, you think, what is this stuff? It was called Son of a Gun Stew. Now, Son of a Gun Stew used everything that a piece of beef had to offer, from the tail to the hoof. It's not the good stuff that you're thinking, well, we'll have ribeye in there, we're gonna have a New York strip. We're gonna have, right above the hoof to the hock, peel that meat off there, kidneys, brains, heart, liver, any organ that you can stick in there that maybe wasn't gonna get used for something else, it's just a catch-all for what we call the leftover parts. Now, let's talk about what Cookie brought with him. You know, I figure he had probably four Dutch ovens. Too big, too small. He left three or four bean pots, two coffee pots, a shovel, an ax, cross-cut saw, and he's gonna have at least a rifle or a shotgun and a pistol. Cookie didn't need refrigeration. Refrigeration hadn't even been invented. There wasn't no little wooden box with a block of ice in it out there where he was. There was no canned milk, really, that he was gonna take with him. It was sourdough starter. Sourdough played a very important part in Cookie's role as being a cook from anywhere from I'm gonna make biscuits with it, to I'm gonna make pie with it, to I can fry meat in it, and a sourdough starter was one of Cookie's prized possessions that he was gonna have with him at all time. Folks ask me, are there still cattle drives? Not like there were before, folks. Not in old Cookie's time going down the Chisholm Trail, no. You know, you know, we've cooked on ranches that have been near 300,000 acres big, and in some of those ranches, there would be pastures that would be 25, 30,000 acres. And there may be 14, 1,500 head of cattle in that one specific area. So instead of taking them from south to north, no. Them cattle are going to a set of pens, a specific spot in that particular part of the ranch to where we can bring everything to it, funnel it in a set of pens, then we can begin to work the cattle. It's time to vaccinate. 
time to brand, time to ear tag, time to castrate. Spring works are over or even fall works when it's weaning time. And all this has been branded, all of it has been straightened out. People are back to their prospective pastures and the cattle that we need to be somewhere else are shipped on a truck, not a rail car anymore. You'll bring what we call a big old pot-bellied cow truck in there, he'll back up to a chute, they'll load 80 head on there and he's gone. And he's probably headed for a feedlot. They're gonna take them up there, start feeding these cattle and we're gonna make beef that y'all are gonna see in the grocery store. So is there still a chuck wagon? Is there still a cook? You bet your bottom dollar there is. It's what I've been doing for more than about 30 years probably. Because when you get this, this ranch that's going to move all these cattle or it's spring works or it's fall works, and you're going to bring in a crew 12 to 15 strong, just like old Cookie did back in the day, I got to feed them. But most of the time, folks, I'm going to get set at a set location somewhere on that ranch. Maybe not the whole thing, but maybe it's two or three days. Then we move camp. We go to another place on the ranch, maybe we're there two days, maybe we're there a week, but it's the same principle in what old Cookie was doing. I have the same equipment. I have Dutch oven, I have a coffee pot. I have more groceries than he had, I promise you, and I have a little more to work with than he did. You remember me telling you that on the trail with old Cookie's time, there was early, early morning meal and a late, late night meal most of the time. Ain't that way no more. We get three meals a day now. And me and Shan are talking about, we're gonna feed them the best food they ever eat in their life. Now, typical breakfast might start for us most of the time if we're getting up, 2.45 to 3 o'clock, because breakfast is gonna be from 4.30 to 5.30, depending on what season it is. When they come in there, what's the first thing on? We've got two of them big old coffee pots that are rolling that coffee, and I mean, everybody heads to that one spot to pour a cup of coffee. Now, we've made bread, let it rise. It may be sourdough, maybe it's a buttermilk biscuit, but we're gonna have eggs. We're talking probably three eggs per person on a ranch because they're doing a lot of work. We're gonna mix us some jalapenos in there, some cheese, sausage, bacon, pile it on that plate, cover it up with gravy and call it good. We'd also serve pancakes. We'd have breakfast burritos on occasion, but we'd get them fed, they go do their job, and they're always coming back. Noon meal, a lot of casseroles, chicken fried steak and gravy, mashed potatoes, stuff like that, but there was always a dessert. Noon, the cowboys might not eat quite as much as they did at breakfast because they've still got to go back and work that afternoon, but when they come in for supper, we're fitting to put it on them, we are. They'd be ribeye sometime. They'd be baked potatoes, sparkling potatoes, hominy and green chili casserole, homemade cakes, cobblers, pork chops. We even have catfish night. But when them guys get through, what are they looking for? A recliner and a nap. Now, people ask me this question all the time. How do you refrigerate stuff? How do you keep it from going bad? Well, when we're gonna be at a ranch, say it's five weeks long, I'm gonna send a grocery list to that ranch. They're gonna pick up all the groceries. They're gonna have stocked when I get there. It's gonna be at, at a certain place and all the groceries are gonna be in there, whether it's frozen, fresh, or dried. And then I'm gonna stock one week at a time. Then somebody's gonna bring it to me. Now I use Good Yeti ice chest. When we're talking about we need to keep some meat frozen, okay? I'm gonna lay some dry ice in the bottom of a Yeti cooler take me some of them paper grocery sacks, lay on top, and then I'm gonna put just sack ice down there. Then I can lay that meat in there, just keep stacking it up, shut that lid good. Folks, I have got me a freezer, but also I've got a cooler over here with meat that I'm gonna use that day that's already, it's not frozen anymore, it's there. I'm gonna have a produce cooler, I'm gonna have a dairy cooler. You know, there's a lot of things changed from the 1870s to now, and there's been many a thousand pound of beef that went up a trail or in a railhead, or in a grocery store. But folks, the ways and the means are still the same. And it's still the same great fulfillment and something that I get in my heart that we get to do this job uh, and pass it on. And we're honored and we're privileged that we get still serving this purpose to pass on something to another generation maybe that, hey, we're following in the footsteps of some of the greatest people in the world, whether they was horseback or in a wagon seat. I commend them, I do. And it is with pride and honor that I salute that flag over there and all the veterans and servicemen and women that have kept it flying free. We appreciate you, one and all, we do. For the rest of you, hey, we hope that you enjoyed this little backup in history and going down trail that was then and now. Thank you each and every one, God bless you, and remember, cowboys and beef, gotta have them both.